So that, that experiment is called the Milgram uh, experiment. I was not going to talk about it, but now that you started it, I want to emphasize that it was not screaming. Uh, the, the, the dashboard actually said, deadly. And 80% and of the people continued beyond the level of deadly. And the screaming stopped. And they still continued. So we're basically all uh, killers, murderers. Uh, that's not going to be the topic of my uh, speak, though. Uh, please don't go there. But it does show how easy it is uh, to influence people and to make them do things that they would never thought they would have done uh, when you would have just asked them. And that is kind of cool. I mean, if we ask people, uh, would you buy my product? Most of them say, no, nah, no, nah, probably not. But th there's good news because there are techniques out there that you actually can make sure that they do buy your product. Um, uh, I'll have like 45 minutes, and I made a presentation which is a bit shorter, so I can do a little naughty thing. I'm going to start off with something completely different. It has nothing to do with conversion, but it's just a message I want to spread. And now that you have me on stage, you're probably not going to pull me off. Um, I'm going to talk about my homeland, my home country, which is uh, the Netherlands. I come from here, you see. I actually, this morning I came from Dublin, and I'm not the only one because there's someone else in the audience who came from the Google Conversion Conference uh, uh, last night. But uh, the Netherlands is a kingdom, and I'm very proud to be uh, uh, part of a kingdom. This is uh, our king and queen, if it, right? inaugurated last year. He's called Willem Alexander, and this uh, is our queen, uh, Maxima. And I have an opinion of, about them, and that's the message I want to uh, spread. Because our king is not my ki kind of guy. I'll, sh I'll show you just a small video of how he's, uh, how he's talking to us. Right? There they are, ruling our country. Oh, wait. Actually, I'm going to switch. Is it not in there? I'm sorry for this, but my laptop just crashed before I went on stage. And this is the video. Um, where's the video? It's not in this one either. Excuse me, excuse me. I'll do it without the video because this is not going to work. But it's a pity because it's such a nice video because he's the most boring guy ever on the planet. He's sitting in a chair. No, I'm, I'm fine. It's just no, it's not in there. No, no, it's not. No, yeah, the rest is working, but I'll be fine. Because he's sitting in his chair and he goes like, and the whole country goes like, oh my gosh, no one is watching. It's the least watched program at that point of the day, our king. And that is because he is so slow. He talks slow. He's only dealing with one topic at a time. He is not enthusiastic, he's not emotional, he's rational, he's based on rules, the decisions he makes are all logical, based on reasons. Um, too bad you c I can't show you the video, because it's the most boring guy ever. There's one thing I really like about Willem Alexander, and that's just this part. He somehow was able to seduce this woman, Maxima, who is from Argentina, and she is, she's definitely my type of girl. I, I use the same age as I am, and I, I don't know how he did it, but I would have loved to be in his place, because my God, what a woman is she. She is the opposite of Willem. She is pure emotion, and she laughs, she cries. Hell, she's sexy. She's got a beautiful face and huge, beautiful breasts. I love my queen, right? Um, when you bring her to a party, Arvin van Bugel, one of our better, better DJs, she goes like, woo! While he is standing there like, mm. There's one, 
so she's the complete opposite, right? Basically, she, she's, she's, she's fast, she never sleeps, she parties, she's emotional, intuitive, she's naughty, she doesn't like rules like Willem does. When, she, when there are rules, she gets naughty, she goes like, oh, I'll do it the other way around. Um, she can do a hundred things at, ti- uh, at a time. She's totally, it seems to be uh, not costing her en- any energy. But there's one little disadvantage, and that she has little control over her behavior. She says things on national television like, uh, yeah, my husband, he's a, li- he's a little dumb. <laughs> I'm sure that was not pre-programmed in the script, and she was not supposed to say that, although she is right. <laughs> so they together rule our country, and um, that's just, I wanted to make you uh, aware of that. Oh, that's, uh, she's ruling our country, right? He's definitely not. We're all, we're all looking at her. So back to the presentation. Um, why am I here? Well, I'm asked to here to speak to you because I'm a psychologist. And I'm as worse as it gets because both my parents are psychologists. My only sister became a psychologist. I married a psychologist. Basically, it's all about psychology in my family. I, I like to joke when we meet each other that we say, hey, how am I doing? And I've been testing all the insights that we, have got, uh, that we got from psychology and behavioral economics. And I've applied them online because online you can do experiments, we call it A-B testing, and I've tested and I've tested, I'm running like a hundred tests at, at, at one moment. I'm trying to blog about it, and that's how the organizers found me, because of my blog. It's going to be a tool that's going to help you find the right persuasion technique, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the techniques in there. What do I do for a living? Well, I help uh, my clients to separate consumers from their money, right? So I'm, I'm finding clients with money, I identify them, separate them, and make sure that he gets that money. I'm in the business of separating consumers from money. Clickers in there. Or I'm in the business of boosting uh, happy consumers because not all uh, uh, clients like that. They feel sort of guilty, so okay. Doesn't really matter, as long as it's about consumers, because there is something about a consumer that um, I'd like to stress, and that is, a consumer is a brain. (laughs) Trying to get the consumer out this thing, like, here he is. Here you have a consumer, 100 billion neuron cells, 1,000 billion glial cells, a thousand times a thousand connections between these cells, This is the most complex thing that we know exists in the universe. Maybe uh, the universe itself. Uh, But, so we're in the business of like the most complex thing we know? Yep, get used to it. Um, Who has knowledge about that brain? Uh, There are several options. Um, Several kind of people who you can ask um, whether they know about the brain. And the first one is, of course, people who know conversion. So whom of you is uh, doing something with conversion? Can I see hands? All uh, right. The, the larger part. Uh, can I ask you, like, so it's about half of you, right? I'm going to ask you wh- which variation wins. Is it the variation where we align text left? Or is it the variation where we align it in the middle? Can I see hands for uh, uh, this one, left aligned? All right, <laughs> center aligned. A bit, bit 50-50, so that doesn't help asking the expert to get the 50-50 answer. It's this one, I'll explain you later on why. Oh, that was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. <laughs> um, I have a picture for that, wait. Oh, Ow. <laughs> I'll just go back to this one. Uh, so the question was, would it be uh, with a pop-up or without the pop-up? So yeah, it's with the pop-up. Uh, I'll just continue. I'll show you later on why. This always makes people feel bad because they are here with their boss and they get a good salary and then the boss gets away like, oh, you didn't know the right answer. I'll give you an easy one. I'll give you an easy one. So this is Vilma and this is Julia. And if you ask boys to go on a speed date, which one do they prefer? Can I see hands for Vilma? (laughs) 
No. Julia? Yeah, you're way better at this. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Wilma. So we should be in the dating business, not in the conversion business. Right? That was easy. So you don't know. Maybe the customer himself knows. Ask the customer. Okay, you know what you get? You get this. Can I have uh, audio? Yeah, it is in. Uh, the fuck, you know what's happening? Yeah, no, it is. Heeft hij een mobiele telefoon? Nee hoor, heb ik niet. Waarom heeft hij dat in? Nou, ik zie er nog niet van in. Dan ben je op de advies en dan word je gebeld. <laughs> ik heb een gewone telefoon, daarvoor moet ik een mobiel hebben. Dat is handig. Maar als ik ergens strand, dan is er ook altijd ergens wel een telefoon zelf, een boerderij met een boer met een telefoon. We hebben het jaren zo gedaan en ik vind het wel goed zo. Als mensen mij bereiken willen, dan kunnen ze dat met een brief doen. Well, you get the point, right? We don't know. How we will behave in the future. You know, we don't even know why we behave like we behave at the moment. So don't ask your customer. He doesn't know. Oh, we need knowledge about the brain. We don't know. They don't know. Who knows? Well, there is actually a really cool thing, and it's called science. We spend four trillion dollar a year globally on science. And more and more of that science budget goes to studying the brain. Even marketing starts studying the brain, calls it neuromarketing. It has nothing to do with neurons, but still they call it neuromarketing. Uh, uh, we, we've got economics, huh? they call it behavioral economics. And so everyone's realizing, wow, we are a brain, we should know more about the brain. What does science tell us about persuasion, how we can influence people? When we talk about persuasion, we always talk about this guy. Anyone knows who he is? It's uh, Robert Cialdini. He's a very good researcher. He did amazing studies 40 years ago. He uh, wrote a very good book, Influence, 40 years ago. Uh, and then he did nothing. He's monetizing his, uh, his six weapons of influence. Uh, I'm not... I'm, uh, he's, he did absolutely really cool studies, but... I'm saying, but, this is me. <laughs> and I knew I could use this picture on stage, so I did a little crazy. Because I wanted then to show that there are other sciences out, the, out there, like the one uh, just mentioned, Kahneman, but not Kahneman, just Kahneman, all the other really cool, uh, and there are mo lots and lots more. There are also women, I got the remark, there are women in there. Yeah, excuse, excuse me. There are also very good uh, psychology women. That's actually the reason why I start, started studying psychology, right? Because of the women. I studied physics beforehand, there, was, there were no women there. And what does science tell us about the brain? It's been mentioned before, but I'll dive a little bit deeper into it. It tells us that we have two types of brain processes. We call it dual processing models. And the one model calls it central versus peripheral. The other calls it heuristic versus systematic. And Kahneman calls it uh, system one and system two. So system two and system one. System two is who you are. Right? Think about yourself, like I am Bart. Okay, that's system two at work, because it's conscious. You're consciously thinking about yourself, I am Bart, and it happens that that's also the system that is very uh, rational, uh, logical, uh, um, uh, it, can, uh, uh, it can make decisions based on rules and reasons, it costs a lot of effort and energy, and it's very easily distracted, but it can control our other system, which is system one. That's the always-on, even if you sleep system, which is completely automated, it's uh, 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 f completely subconscious, it has an enormous capacity, it can uh, deal with 40 million pieces of information a second, um, costs no energy, uh, but it has no control over itself, right? We need this system to control that, because that's automated. It's a little bit like our king and queen, right? So if, if I want you to remember one slide, remember this. Oh yeah, well that was the guy who puts his king in his queen in our brain, because in my brain, in the consumer's brain, in his brain, there are these two types of processes, and they're a bit like his royal family. 
Well, oh. What can you do with that insight that there are two types of processes? I'm, I'm going to tell you about two aspects of it. I'm going to talk about attention and perception, because I heard a lot of things about design uh, going on today. And I'm going to talk about the final decision. How do they decide? Whom of you knows this test? Not everyone. Okay. We start counting how many passes the team makes. One, two, three. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? It's hard to see the screen now. So why is that? Why does two-thirds of the people who see this movie for the first time not see the gorilla or the moonwalking bear? That is because our consciousness really can pay attention to one thing at a time. It can only deal with one task. This is what I'm focusing at. Actually, you are seeing the moonwalking bear. If we measure response time, uh, we, we show you pictures of giraffes and, and, and a moonwalking bear, uh, you'll respond quicker to the moonwalking bear. Your subconsciousness saw it, but Ma that's Maxima, right? But Maxima thinks like, should I bother Willem? Oh, no, no, he's very, very busy. He's counting 12, 13, right? I shouldn't bother him with the information that there's a very strange monkey walking around. So she doesn't. It's very friendly of her. I'll do it the other way around. They are going to change things, right? Can I have audio? Murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Well, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Oh. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. So, you know, even if you know it's impossible to pay attention on this, and there's so much changing... Your brain does not, uh, is not capable to, to deal with that. Your consciousness is way too incapable with so much information, so it just makes up a reality that looks like a, a standard and fixed, and, and uh, it's, there's nothing changing. Is that useful when we're talking about conversion? Oh. Well, I think it's very important to realize that we don't see reality as it is. So your customers don't see a page or, or, or an app as it is. It's their brain making the image up, right? You see a room around yourself right now. Um, that room is not the way your brain tells you it is. It's telling you it based on a very, very small amount of visual input. And the next video is from Henry Markram, who has $40 million budget to, uh, to uh, study the brain. Um, he says how much of the visual field we see is actual visual input. When you walk up to a door and you open it, what you compulsively have to do to perceive is to make decisions. Thousands of decisions about the size of the room, the walls, the height, the objects in this room. 99% of what you see is not what comes in through the eyes. It is what you infer about that room. So it's 1% of the visual field that you see is actual visual input. 
And that tells you why the, uh, all the, the persuasion techniques that are based on perception are so hugely effective, extremely effective. I'm going to continue a little bit uh, on the system one and system two, because we're now talking about the, the system two, right? Willem, he's consciously aware, but there's also unconscious aware, subconscious awareness, I should say. Um, there was a time that we were allowed to cut in the brains of uh, monkeys and other animals. And what psychologists did, or neurologists did, is they cut away the visual part of the brain. And then a monkey cannot see. This is the monkey, Helen. And you'll notice that actually she is acting like she can see. But she can't. She's not aware, consciously aware, of anything in her surroundings. Yet when she walks, she's not touching anything. This is Maxima. This tells us how much, of the, uh, how much we need conscious awareness. Right? We don't need that to function. It's a very recent add-on in our brain. It's a very useful one. I mean, you wouldn't have been consciously aware of yourself if you wouldn't have had it, but it's only, it started growing probably 200,000 years ago, which if you look at the evolution of this brain from the little worm that was on the stone, you know, finding his little dot, uh, until now, if you would squeeze that into 24 hours, we have conscious awareness 15 seconds. This is a very recent add-on that we still have to uh, uh, develop. We recently found, like one and a half year ago, that there's a pathway from the eye to the brain, but there's actually a second one as well, which is much more qu uh, quicker than the one we always thought there was. So there are basically two ways you perceive, consciously, subconsciously. I'll give you some examples of uh, wh what we do, because I run a little company with five psychologists, or six, including myself, and a lot of uh, A-B test guys. And we do a lot of A-B testing. For us, that stands for anonymous brain testing. You know, we're testing brains, and they're not aware of it. Um, and this is a very g simple example. We're in the bannering business. Uh, the, the biggest bank in the Netherlands is advertising for uh, consulting uh, for a mortgage. And they found that if the banner looks like a search result, mm, it gets more clicks because uh, Maxima is scanning your yeah, house, 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 oh, banner, for house, house. So when it's a house, it, uh, it, it, she's uh, uh, paying attention to it. But how to get real conscious attention, Willem, then we need to do a little trick, which is we just put the house upside down. And why did we do that? Because you cannot process a picture automatically. Maxima cannot deal with it when it's upside down, because this is supposed to be on top and that's supposed to be on the bottom. And then Maxima starts calling Willem. Willem, I don't get this, I don't get this, this is new for me, I cannot automatically process this. This more than triples the click-through rates. We were not measuring uh, the end-to-end -end by that time. But it's a very, very nice effect. My dad is actually having his house for sale now and he's put it upside down, he's, get, he's getting a lot more. So it wor still works. That's one way. That's, that's how to get the attention of Willem, right? Because you're looking at houses, but we are trying to persuade you to think about a uh, 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 mortgage consult. You need conscious awareness for that. This is another test. This is a page full of text, uh, which is all Willem, because you have to concentrate, read the text. There's nothing really exciting for Maxima on this page, which I think is a problem in itself. There's only this pig. And we want both Willem and Maxima to realize that they have a very good interest rate for this savings account. It's not that good, right? But it's not. Compared to others, it's, it's pretty good. 2.7%. They win uh, with the 2.7%. But we said, okay, Willem will read it, but how to get Maxima happy with a figure like 2.7%? Because she doesn't know about figures, right? She cannot calculate. She can li she, the only thing that she can do is relative. Like, this is more... And this is less. She's good at that. But 2.7 says nothing. So what we did is we took it from the title, placed it near the pig that is probably giving her a little bit of uh, uh, emotions, just to make that association. The brain is only one big associative network. So we're, we're, we're sort of combining the 2.7 with the only image that makes her a bit emotionally aroused. 24% in the first test and 30% in the retest. More saving accounts sold if we 
place it like this instead of like that. Faces. How many of you have a face on it uh, on their website? Just a picture of the face. No one. Oh, that's really good. I was expecting more. <laughs> uh, this is the bank that I'm working for. Uh, they had the rule that in each and every picture there should be a face. But we already tested that at the same bank. But there was a new manager, and he said, "Like, no, no, we have a trust issue. I know that trust does a better. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it, you gain more trust if you see image of, images of people." But the thing is that Maxima loves to see faces. She's directly scanning the faces. But there's no message here, right? This is very conscious behavior. A lot of people say like 95% of each decision is uh, 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 subconsciously. That's bullshit. It's a huge range. Like on average, maybe that's true. But a, a bank account or a, or a mortgage in this case, no, no, no. That's, that's way more conscious than, than 5%. We need them to consciously concentrate on where should I go? Should I... Mm, are you still looking for a, a, a house or are you already interested in a mortgage? They have to choose here. And the more we take away the faces and the more blurry we make the images, having the text stand out, the more they are actually clicking and asking for a consult. Do not use faces. If you have faces, get a good Photoshopper and at least have the, have the eyes in the face. Look in the right direction. We call it gay skewing. You sell 9% more mortgages with the same bank if you have uh, the eyes looking in this direction instead of straight at you. Whereas I'm not a good Photoshopper here. You can see that I Photoshopped it. It's actually not that, not that well done. But So if you have faces, direct the gaze where they're looking at. Here we added a very small arrow because this was the uh, redesign, redesign for a hotel site, and it was one of these long read pages, right? But there was some pretty cool content down there. So we wanted people to go down more and read that content over there. It's a very simple trick. We just added a small triangle and arrow pointing down. You know how many people got to the bottom of the page? 10 times more people. Did that increase conversion? Well, it depends on the content that's on the, on the bottom of the page, right? 60% more hotel rooms sold just by adding a stupid arrow. Hey, look there, Maxima. It's automated behavior. By the way, I do agree with the, uh, what does uplift say? But I'm just not allowed to say the, the big numbers, right? how many they are selling. And, it's, it, and when I'm saying 68, right, that was, that's one test. You should always retest and retest, and then you get a good feeling about the effect size of your, uh, of your test. And this is the last one. It's, uh, th well, you should center a line. Yeah, that is if you want people to be notifying this button. Yeah, because every, everything is centered like this. I click uh, and that's why the button is click more, because it's just all pointing to the button. This even works with AdWords. Always make sure that your AdWords campaign is in the form of an arrow that increases the intention to click. There's a really nice blog post by Jeremy Shoemaker, the, uh, the affiliate uh, guy from uh, the States, about that. So, very minor changes, huge effects based on perception. I'm now going to dive into a different topic, because you've steered their attention, they've been looking at the things that you want them to look at, you've been realizing, okay, this is what Maxima should get, this is what Willem should get, now they have to decide. How does that work? I'm going to play a little game with your, uh, with your own uh, mind. Just to show you how lazy and depleted and not, uh, not awake our Willem, our system 2 usually is. So I have two kids, I really do. And if I tell you that one of them is a boy, how big is the chance that the other one is a boy too? Maxima will tell you it's 50%, but it's not, right? This is just logical thinking, right? How, how big is the chance? Who, kno who knows another answer than, than 50%? 25, oh, it's actually one third. Anybody able, does anyone have a Willem in his brain that's able to explain that? I'll explain it to you. Or not. No, just come up to with the drinks. Like, how was that with the problem with, the, with your kids? 
There's one third chance that the other one is a boy too. This is just logical thinking. It's just showing how bad our brain is in logics, right? We don't have a brain that's built on, on, on rules. Or Even if you know an answer, it's still very often very difficult for Willem to see the reality as it is, or to realize what it is, when, because Maxima is just so much more strong. We have a bit these, an issue here with the lines in the screens, I realize. Because if you look at these towers, when this, the lines are not there, the right one feels as if it's tilted to the right more. I don't know if you see that. These lines are a little bit... <laughs> but it's exactly the same picture. Although, if you know it, that exactly the same picture, when you look at it again, it still feels like it's tilted. And that's, you know, sometimes Willem has no control over Maxima at all. Luckily, sometimes he does. I hope this one's working. If, if you look at, these fi uh, at this cross here in the middle, right? don't know if you know this one. This is actually, this is really a bit creepy. And you just keep looking at the cross, then the faces become really, really ugly. The eyes are really grotesque. Now look at the faces. They're not ugly, they're normal, fi they're normal pictures. Right? But it's, as soon as you start looking at the, at the plus sign again, and you wait a while, then, oh, there they come again. <laughs> These demons from my brain. Yeah. Okay. So what's happening there? Well, Kahneman calls it fast and slow. But we're finding out more and more about the fast part of our brain, right? Because the slow part is easy. That's our rational, logical, conscious thinking. We are aware of that part of the brain. That's not the difficult part. It's the subconscious part. And we find out it's actually not that fast. We thought it was like amazingly fast. Well, it is amazingly fast in a few things. But, for example, uh, face, uh, recognizing faces, that takes a little while. So these pictures are just changing too quick to have them analyzed. And then Maxima starts mixing them up. So you see these eyes on this face and that mouth over there. She just has not enough time to process the, uh, the visual image. But when Willem comes around, he says, okay, we'll start looking at these pictures and only these pictures. Yeah, easy. She's used to scan one face at a time. And you actually do not see the other face at that precise moment. And what's this? That's where I'm presenting the PDF version of my slides. Oh, no. Thank you, Microsoft. I don't know, it opens the presentation of yesterday and uh, you know what I'll actually do. I know what I do, I get a better... Don't tweet the hashtag that I'm going to show you now, because I'll just grab the presentation of uh, last week. I'm sure that one works. Here we are. So sorry for this. Where was I? I was here. Yeah, you can put me on, my on again. about the decision. I have a very interesting study which was done by Michael Gazinaga and Ledoux. He was in the Netherlands uh, two weeks ago. There were like 15 people in the room. Why so little? Anyway. 
The studies he did was on split brain patients. So uh, we are lucky to have people on this planet with spasms, epileptic episodes. And why is that uh, so interesting as a psychologist? Well, what neurologists do is they cut through this part of the brain, which is uh, the, the, the bridge of information between the two parts of the brain. It's called the corpus callosum. And they do that because if someone gets a spasm, it's an only one half of the body that goes spastic. And with the other, they can still steer their car and not hit a tree, for example. But yeah, so when you have two parts of the brain which cannot communicate, what does that tell us about how we make decisions? The funny thing is that what uh, Gazinaga and Ledoux did is that they showed these people with a split brain, they showed them a picture, very short. And the picture was a chicken foot, and a visual perception where so that this chicken foot ends up in this part of the brain, the left side. And they showed them a snow-covered lane that ends up in this part of the brain. And they asked, will you pick a card? One with each hand. But each hand is controlled by one part of the brain. And the people picked a chicken head and a snow shovel. Which is pretty normal, right? Probably each of us would choose the snow shovel and, the show, uh, snow shovel and the, the chicken head. The funny thing happens when you ask people why. Because split brain patients have a very funny reason to do that. They say the chicken head comes with the foot, right? That's an easy, easy one. So far, so good. And the snow shovel, I'm going to use that to dig his poo. And they all say that. Or something like that. And what's happening here? The funny thing about our left hemisphere, the left part of the brain, is that it is the location where language is, uh, is placed, right? Is this the left part? Yeah. So Broca and Wernicke are the two parts of the brain that process uh, uh, language. So we're actually only asking the left hemisphere. And the left hemisphere only saw the chicken foot and only controlled this hand to pick, pick the chicken head. So it knows perfectly why it did that, but it didn't know why the snow shovel was, was picked. Instead of saying, I have no clue why I chose the, the shovel, the brain goes, ooh, that feels, that feels bad. I have no reason for my behavior. Ooh, you know what? I make up a reason. I'll tell them I'm going to dig poo. And we call that post-decision rationalization. And I'm sorry to say that, but most of your decisions are post-decision rationalized. So if... You know, if I come home and I've, I've bought a, whatever, an insurance or a, a new cover for my iPhone, my wife says, why did you buy it? I'll tell her one, two, three reasons, but those are not the reasons. Those are the reasons that my brain made after I decided to buy. That's why I, like, I prefer to call our consciousness our comfortness. It's comforting you. Ah, Bart, you are, you are a perfect, it's logical what you do, it's, it's rational, you're, you're a good guy. And before I get to the A-B testing examples, I'm going to play a little bit with your system one and system two again, um, because I want you to uh, see how bad Willem, our system two, is at calculating. Um, so there's one person in the audience who should not join me. <laughs> uh, and at the end, I ask another question. So please calculate. You don't have to say it out loud, but just keep calculating with me. I have quite a few. They're not too difficult. You know, Sounds like this. How much, how much is this? 21. 21. 21. Now think about a color, and think about a tool. Probably half of you was thinking about the color red. And a little bit more than half of you was thinking about a hammer. And the funny thing is that I would if w I wouldn't have not have done the calculations before showing for asking the question with a color and a, ha and a tool, 
is that the percentages are much, much lower. Why is that? We have two systems in our brain, and one of those systems, our rational, conscious thinking, gets depleted really, really quickly. And those calculations, they, they were hard work for him, or her, at least system two. So the, the energy is drawn, right? And then I ask for a color. And then there's only one system left, because system two is, cool, I'm ready. Because system, system one, the automatic system, cannot do the calculation. But the very simple ones, like two plus two, she can do. But this was Willem. But Willem was gone, and it was only Maxima answering the color and the uh, tool question. And then you get the most prototypical answers. And apparently red is the most prototypical color we have in Western societies. And a hammer is the most prototypical tool. This explains a lot why usability now and then works. And very often not, but uh, when you make things more usable, they cost less energy, and there's l more energy left down the funnel, more energy left, and they finally convert. Uh, if, you do, if you tweak usability issues at the beginning of your funnel, have a look at how people continue through the funnel. You'll see that the effect is not only here. It's also down the funnel that you see increases in conversion because you drew, drew less energy out of their brain with a difficult, let's say, uh, product configurator. You made that one easy, and then the whole steps during the checkout process is improved well because they just have more energy left. I'll show you some test examples that we uh, have based on these uh, insights. And the first one is, so Willem can only pay attention to one thing at a time. Well, we have a client. This is a, a Belgium uh, part of this uh, bank, and they have to show the, the interest rates uh, with the base rate and the extra rate when you're not touching your money for half a year. But this is a calculation, and it's actually a pretty hard one. Right? You end up 2.35. Whoa, energy drawn. We, you shouldn't do that. So all we did, and this was actually a competition. There were, there were some other digital marketing or conversion uh, companies, and the winner was allowed to be their, uh, uh, their uh, normal company. Um, and they made redesigns, and they did it all over again. And all we did was just emphasize this one. Yeah, it's 1.95. And yeah, we had a look at the competition, and it was a good base rate. But just let Willem focus on one thing. This is a decision. This is not done emotionally, saving an account. That's it's probably, I don't know, it's 50-50. Uh, uh, Maxima likes the feeling of having money as a, as a for, for security reasons, and Willem is dealing with all the technical specs like interest rates. So that's why we tried just to emphasize this one. It was more than 30% uplift just by focusing on this one effect. Another one, which is about depletion. I do this one very, very often. We are looking at a page, and we are looking at products that we uh, lo love to buy, Maxima loves them to buy, but Willem has a problem with spending the money because then he cannot spend the money on other things. So what we should do is we should, we should on purpose deplete Willem. We should make consciousness too tight to think about the fact that we're spending money. And all we do is we find another link on the page. It right? can be anything. So we found this one. Add to wish list, it says. So this is order now, add to wish list. Then we, put it, we took it from there. And we put it there, just to make the brain choose between two options, because that's draining energy. Or should I order now, or should I add to wish list? No, nah, no, nah, not add to wish list. Oh, and Maxima goes, yeah, 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 I got order, I got order. 16% uplift across the whole web shop was just, you know, the magazine, poof, in the back end, measurable high effect. And I, I take a little sidestep. Because I'm in the conversion optimization business, right? But I hate the term conversion. I hate the term rate optimization. I hate rates. And I think it's actually not what we're doing. Because what we're doing is we're growing companies. But we just need the buy-in from the higher level to realize that we, that's what we do. And one of the tricks we do, like we did with this client, is that we, we'll, just, we'll start testing it, right? These, these guys have shitloads of conversion, so their test capacity is probably like 200 tests a month. So we're managing to do about 150 a month. And we said, well, we'll do one month of testing. 
and we're not going to disclose any of the results. We'll just be, at the end of the month, we'll put them all live. And then we'll look at the back-end office. What does that do in sales? And you know what I want with the money you're gaining? You give it back to me. Because I start doing even more experiments. Uh, more experiments. You just keep... I'm, I'm, you're, I cost nothing. I'm free. And the, the boss likes that, right? The hippo goes like, ooh, he costs nothing. But meanwhile, I get more and more money exponentially to grow that company hockey stick uh, um, and get really enthusiastic board level feedback instead of only a marketeer or a web analyst liking what we do. One choice paradox. Give them another choice. But that's if you want Willem to be depleted, right? If it's actually a very rational choice, you shouldn't do this because then you want Willem to be awake and not depleted. So th think, start thinking about those two systems and when to apply them. I'm cool. I'll skip this one because this is the same one, but with a Willem and Maxima in between. And I really like this one because this is the typical test that we do when we enter a new client. There's a lot of discussion going on about which are our USPs, and then we say, like, yeah, bullshit, these are post decision rationalizations, so they should be good. And so we start testing, and nothing happens. And we, start, we do those tests, and we say, friend, it's not going to matter, you know, it's not going to do anything, and it does nothing. But we add another var variation because Maxima is not very excited by a bulleted list like this. So what we do, and I don't know whether that w is the same here, but instead of these bullets, we do green check marks, if I get them, right? these. On average, a 40% uplift. Just three green check marks. They draw attention, but they also make feel good. And, but it's very culturally dependent, right? I know in Sweden, this is the sign for you did it wrong at school, so it doesn't work. John Eggman has been testing uh, uh, with us, and it, it has to be a red R, which would, in the Netherlands would definitely work. But it's the same principle. You are uh, making Maxima feel good again, just like she used when she was a small kid. Yeah, this is good, this is good, and this is good. These are the more sub subliminal tests that you uh, should be running. And then finally, I was saying we never ask a customer uh, his opinion. Well, that's not completely true, we do that. Mainly because we want to know what's the goal. You know, if it's a very goal-directed website, what's the goal where people are here for? And then we can split in analytics how the behavior looks like and we get better hypothesis for testing. But we also, er we measure everything. So we also measure what's the effect of the pop-up itself. And we found that it's always increasing conversions with about anywhere between 20 and 30%. And we, we, we started thinking like, what's happening here? You know, is, it, is it the fact that uh, people have to touch the website? Is it the content? Is, what is it? And we did a lot of tests, and we found out that it's actually just the fact that they touch the website. Because this stupid pop-up, which is just a script, it grabs the picture which is on, on the, you know, the hero shot, puts it in a light box, go to the website, order across, 90% cl cl clicks across because we were used to, oh, I hate that. Willem says, oh, I hate pop-ups, it's so bad. Usability test will tell you, oh, don't do that. It's a UX principle. Fuck it, do it. It's always increasing conversions if you want to make Maxima happy because she loves touch. Yeah, if I would ask you to touch your neighbor and it would scan your brain, there's a lot of shit happening in your brain, no matter what kind of neighbor you're having. Uh, you don't have to do that, but just I mean, you, you get the feeling, right? So that's uh, where I end because, you know, Maxima, just make sure you touch her. She loves anything that comes by just as soon as we're touching each other. <laughs> and that's why it's so good that, I mean, I totally love her, but I think it's a real good thing that he, he's in the background looking and making sure that she need, she's need beha not behaving like a total uh, rabbit and screwing around everyone. And that's why it's not too bad to have these two ruling our company and ruling our customer's brain. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Is there any Willem who, there ask, any Willem? <laughs> who wants to ask a question? Are there any questions? <laughs> okay, so yes. I guess we are, you know, out for the day. So yeah, I was in between you and the beer, so yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's a hard yeah. slot. <laughs> Okay, so one more time. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, don't, 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 don't applaud. Wait, wait, wait.
I'm saying, we measure everything. I have an app for that. So I'm always measuring the... Uh, Okay. Yeah, where is he? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it. Okay. Start. Oh, no. This is not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 92. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you.